Hello everybody, this is Anthony Wolf. We are continuing the proofs of God. Uh, this is the 14th lecture. Still continuing on the consequences of the cosmological proof. The finitude of spirit. This dogmatism of the absolute separation of the finite and the infinite is logical. It is an assertion of the nature of the concepts of the finite and the infinite that is treated in logic. Here we confine ourselves in the first instance to those determinate qualities that we have partly dealt with in the preceding lectures, but that are also found in our consciousness. The qualities that belong to the nature of the concepts themselves and that have been exhibited in the logic in their own pure determinateness and their connection must show themselves to be present in our ordinary consciousness as well. When, therefore, it is said that the being of the finite is only its own being, and not at all the being of another, it is declared that there is no possible passage from finite to infinite, and thus no mediation between them, neither in themselves nor in and for knowledge. The result is that, although the finite may perchance indeed be mediated through the infinite, the reverse is not true, which is just the point of interest. Appeal is thus already made to the fact that the spirit of humanity elevates itself out of the contingent, temporal, and finite to God, the absolutely necessary, the eternal, and the infinite. Appeal is made to the fact that the so-called gulf does not exist for spirit, that it actually makes this transition, that the human heart will not accede to the understanding's assertion of this absolute separation, will not admit that there is any such gulf, but on the contrary actually makes this transition in the elevation to God. The ready response to this, however, is that if the fact of this elevation is granted, there is a transition of spirit, to be sure, but not of spirit in itself. Not a transition in the concepts of finite and infinite, or indeed of the concepts themselves. The reason for this is simply that in the concepts as here understood, the being of the finite is its own being and not the being of another. When we thus regard the finite being as standing only in relation to itself, it is only for itself and is not a being for another. Therewith it is removed from the region of change, it is unchangeable and absolute. This is how the matter stands with these so-called concepts. Those who assert the impossibility of any such transition will not admit, however, that the finite, as they conceive it, is absolute, unchangeable, imperishable, and eternal. If the error involving it, involved in taking the finite as absolute were merely an error of the schools, an inconsistency attributable to the understanding, if indeed it is, the, it is found in the most extreme abstractions with which we have to do here, then we might well ask what such an error, for we can indeed find these abstractions contemptible, could pin on the fullness of spirit that a religion is, the same religion that is of great and living interest for the error. But that it is a tightly held finite that constitutes the true interest among these so-called great and living interests is only too evident from the attention paid to religion itself, wherein consistently with the fundamental principle, the preoccupation with the history of finite materials and of external events and opinions far outweighs any concern with the finite content which has admittedly been reduced to a minimum. It is by the employment of thoughts and of these abstract categories of finite and infinite that the surrender of the knowledge of truth is supposed to be justified. But in fact it is in the pure region of thought that all these interests of spirit have free play in order there to obtain their judgment. Sorry, to, in order there to obtain their judgment for thoughts constitute the innermost essence of the concrete actuality of spirit. Let us leave behind this conception of the understanding with the assertion that being of the finite is merely its own being and not the being of another, not the transition itself, and take up the further representation that expressly denominates knowledge. If it is agreed that spirit does actually make this transition, then the fact of this transition is not a fact of knowledge, but of spirit generally and of faith specifically.
it has been sufficiently shown in this transition hold on <coughs> It has been sufficiently shown that this transition, whether in feeling or in faith, or however the mode of its spiritual existence is defined, takes place in the innermost being of spirit in the region of thought. Religion as the innermost affair of human minds in this region of the midpoint and root of its... Uh, uh, sorry. Religion as the innermost affair of human minds in this region... Okay, is in this region the midpoint and root of its pulsation. God, in essence, is thought, the act of thought itself, just as the representation and configuration of God, as also the shape and mode of religion, are defined as feeling, intuition, faith, and so on. Knowledge, however, does nothing more than to bring that innermost element explicitly into consciousness, nothing more than to grasp that thinking pulse by means of thought. In this, knowledge may be one-sided, and feeling, intuition, and faith may belong more essentially to religion, indeed, may be more closely connected with God than the concept of God as thinking and as thought. But this innermost element is present here, and thinking means to know it. Knowledge as such simply means to know it in its essential determinacy. <clears throat> Cognitive knowledge and comprehension are terms that, unlike immediate faith, belong to the culture of our time. They have the authority of a twofold prejudice. On the one hand, they are quite well known in the ultimate categories. Ugh, uh, in regard to which there is no need to inquire further into their meaning and validity. On the other hand, the inability of reason to comprehend and know the true and the infinite is something as settled as their general meaning. The terms cognition and comprehension are like a magic formula. It never occurs to those under the influence of, these pre of the prejudice to inquire what cognition and comprehension are, to get a clear view of what they mean. Yet that would be the one and only important thing if something actually pertinent is to be said about the main question. It would be self-evident from such an investigation that cognitive knowledge merely expresses the fact of the transition that spirit itself makes. And insofar as cognition is genuine cognition and comprehension, it is an awareness of the necessity that is contained in that transition itself. It is nothing but the grasping of this quality that is imminent and present in it. But if, in regard to the fact that the transition from the finite to the infinite, it is replied that this transition takes place in the spirit, or in faith, feeling, and the like, such an answer is not the whole answer, which is rather as follows. Religious faith, feeling, inner revelation means simply that we know God immediately, not through mediation, not through mediation as essential connection of the two sides, but rather in the form of a leap. What we would call a transition is split in this way into two separate acts, which are externally opposed, follow each other in temporal succession only, and are related to each other by being compared or recalled. The finite and the infinite simply remain in this condition of separation. This being presupposed, spirit occupies itself with the finite in a particular way, while its occupation with the infinite by way of feeling, believing, and knowing is a singular, immediate, and simple act, not an act of transition. Just as the finite and infinite are relationless, so too the acts of spirit by which it fills itself with these qualities, fills itself with either the one or the other, are not related to each other, even if they happen to exist simultaneously so that the finite is found in consciousness along with the infinite, they are merely mixed together, they are two independent activities that are not mediated with each other. The repetition in <coughs> sorry. The repetition involved in this representation of the customary division of the finite and the infinite has already been indicated. It is that separation by which the finite is put on one side on its own terms and the infinite on the other over against it, while the former is no less asserted in this way to be absolute. This is the dualism that in further specification is Manichaeanism. 
But even those who establish such a relation will not admit that the finite is absolute, and yet they cannot escape the conclusion that does not merely flow from that assertion, but is just the assertion itself that the finite has no connection with the infinite, that no transition from one to the other is possible, that the one is absolutely cut off from the other. But even if a relationship between the two is imagined after all, it is of a merely negative kind because of the admitted incompatibility between them. The infinite is thought of as the true, as the only affirmative, that is, the abstract affirmative, so that its relation to the finite is that of a power in which the finite is annihilated. The finite, in order to be, must keep away from the infinite, must flee from it. If it comes into contact with it, it can only perish. In regard to the subjective existence of the qualities that we have before us, namely finite and infinite, no and infinite knowledge, the one side that of infinitude is presumed to be human beings' immediate knowledge of God, while the whole of the other side is humanity as such. Just a quick thing. Uh, the annihilation of the finite uh, by the infinite uh, is imminent to the fact that the infinite is that which is non-finite. Uh, so if the finite were to rise to the infinite, it would have to destroy itself as finite. That's why. Uh, if the finite is that which is bounded or limited, and the infinite is that which is unbounded or unlimited, in order for the finite to rise to the uh, infinite, the unlimited, uh, it would itself have to destroy the bounds which make it finite, which is what it is. The human being is the finite about which we are chiefly concerned, and it is just humanity's knowledge of God, whether it is called immediate or not, that is its being, its finite knowledge in the transition from it to the infinite. If, accordingly, the occupation of spirit with the finite and its occupation with the infinite are presumed to be two separated activities, and the latter, as the elevation of the spirit to God, will not itself be this imminent transition, and its occupation with the finite would, in turn, be absolute and utterly confined to the finite as such. We could consider this point at great length, but it may suffice here to remember that, although the finite is the object and end dealt with on this side, spirit can occupy itself with it in a true way, whether in the form of cognition, knowledge, opinion, or in a practical and moral fashion, only in so far as the finite is not taken for itself, but is known, recognized, and engaged in its connection to the infinite, the infinite within it, within it, in so far, in fact, as it has its object and purpose in this determination. It is well enough to know what place is given to the religious element in individuals and indeed in religions themselves, namely that religion in the form of devotion, contrition of the heart and spirit, and sacrifices or offerings comes to be regarded as something set apart with which we can occupy ourselves and then be finished. While secular life, the sphere of finitude exists alongside religion, gives itself over to its own end and remains without any influence upon it of the infinite, the eternal, and the true remains that is, without any passing over into the infinite in the sphere of the finite, without the finite coming to truth and morality through the mediation of the infinite, and so too without the infinite being brought into the presence and actuality through the mediation of the finite. <coughs> uh, this makes for a peculiar thing in which, um, in a real sense, you really cannot logically endorse a thing such like a private religion distinction and a secular public distinction <coughs> that ultimately makes no sense. <coughs> I think so within the, the liberal conception of modernity, the distinction rose uh, despite it being called, you know, secular <coughs> and religion, the actual distinction was more between different institutions.
Yeah, and religion is an institution, by the way. <coughs> but the thing is, you can't... Uh, the superficial distinction between religion and secular matters is that uh, uh, religion as religion uh, still has a positive element in the sense that it's just positive. It's not fully justified. There's a bunch of irrational, just dogmatic elements in religion. Uh, you know, just because the Bible says this, or the Quran says that, or the Bhagavad Gita says this, uh, we can't base our social norms on that. You know, we we must justify them. We must give explanation. They must be understood by everyone, uh, regardless of whether they're here to the dogma or not. <coughs> yeah, yeah, it's dysfunctional otherwise. Uh, but in the sense of religion proper. There cannot be a disconnect between the public and the private in here. Uh, there can be no secular difference. So would you say that the distinction made historically was a contingent distinction based upon a uh, necessary distancing as opposed to uh, what we may think of as like uh, 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 trying to make or like even trying to conceive of what a proper distinction would look like? Uh, well, it is uh, a distinction that arises not contingently. It is a necessary distinction simply because the institution of religion is not philosophy. Therefore, the people who are religious are not going to think about religion philosophically. Otherwise, they'd be doing philosophy. <coughs> uh, and so long as you are stuck in that religious mode of comprehension, uh, you don't really have a fully universal grasp there's there because there's different religious standpoints which are not equal to Hegel, but nonetheless they it's a given they do exist it's a given that any modern society uh, especially now as we become global culture different people with from different backgrounds come together for various reasons out of necessities and contingencies uh, and so therefore to put one dogma over the others is just not going to stand in a modern state. So there's a pragmatism of just the fact that that's not that's going to lead to tensions that are really unnecessary, particularly because the, the questions of dogmas are just questions of dogma. Um, they're not going to be resolved through rational discourse, because otherwise then religion would be philosophy. Uh, but this also points out that these particular religions uh, in a in a modern state would not really be the religion, properly speaking. This is why something like civic religion arises uh, tandem to and which in a way subsumes the differences of religions. So I'm kind of curious. Uh, all right, well, one of my ideas is so how would actually let me let me formulate my question better yeah give me a second <coughs> oh yeah so i was gonna say um to, to the question of conflict right to the question of conflict how would you say that uh that uh this what i think you're suggesting is like a like an artificial uh distinction then like like it's a it's it's sort of a uh it's it, it's sort of a social conflict that arises as opposed to like a, a like a coherent uh conflict my, my question is like how would you say like that uh such religious conflicts get resolved and maybe this goes to your uh a statement earlier about like how you say that you know philosophy doesn't resolve uh dogmatic uh conflicts in in religion yeah i would say it doesn't really resolve i, I would say they, they don't really get resolved they get resolved because people live together and as people live together every generation comes in fresh and so long as people are co-mingle connections are made which create new forms of reason. So necessarily things starts, if there are rigid distinctions, perhaps at the beginning, things start loosening up 
as people intermix. <coughs> uh, and uh, empirically, it is the case that people will intermix. You don't, you don't have to force it. The opposite happens to be the case. You have to force them to not intermix. You have to like actively have institutions stepping in and creating artificial barriers for people to intermix. Uh, and yeah, so when your lives intermix, your ideals will actually intermix. And so these hard distinctions fall away. Uh, they remain to certain extent, extents, but they are very, very blunted. Uh, but the particular uh, point I was trying, I think this is making is this distinction of the finite and the infinite, which uh, he says, like, it's like the distinction between uh, uh, secular life and, the, you know, which is like economics and law and politics uh, and religion. You know, religion is the infinite and politics and other is just the finite, but, and they, they don't really affect each other. But this is an obvious lie. We know this is empirically a lie, and this is even more strongly a logical lie. Of course, the laws in the, in the institutions around you and the way the state operates is going to be affected by what people religiously believe. Uh, no matter how you say, like, oh, well, we can't use religious language, the religious motivations are going to be there, no matter what. People will find a way to rationalize it. Likewise, the secular life also goes into religion. That's why we have stuff like the prosperity gospel and, uh, and all that crap. Uh, they're not isolated from each other. And so in a, in a real practical level, here's like Hegel's point here is that we may say, well, the finite is here, the infinite is there, and never the, do the two cross over. But practically, we're always crossing them over because they have to. I mean, that, that makes sense to me. Like, if you exist in a space with with others, right, and, uh, you know, those others aren't religiously motivated, well, that's going to impact the way that you engage with the... the, the, the that's going to affect the way you engage with the world, even if you, like, think it's secular or not. Yep. Which is why, you know, it's uh, <coughs> there's plenty of books and articles you can read about how uh, uh, stuff like new, like atheism or new atheism has a very particular Western flavor. <laughs> and the Western flavor is the Judeo-Christian uh, Islamic background. You know, for Europe it's mostly Judeo-Christian, but there's still an Islamic background there. Uh, in which our atheism is very much a reflection of that. Like the structure, the deep structures of that have not really changed. <coughs> so how would you equate this to how would some people say are, you know, people talk about things like a state religion, like, like you know, people will sometimes use something like North Korea as an example, you know, that's a, that's a state religion. Um, how, how would you make an, uh, an equivocation between, you know, what we're talking about and such a, such a thing? Well, I don't know anything about Korean society, so I can't, well, North Korean society, I can't speak to that. Uh, but just look at China. Like, uh, China doesn't have a state of religion. Uh, technically, they're secular. Uh, but there is actually a a religious background to the way people relate to the state, in which, uh, and this goes back all the way to ancient China, meaning you know um, back to about you know even three thousand BC. <coughs> I mean that that makes a lot of sense though the way you know we may conceive of like how, uh, you know, I ideals of of Confucianism and Taoism and in fact legalism have influenced China and still influence China today? Uh, yeah. So, uh, <coughs> I think that, hey, uh, it seems to me that Hegel would not be entirely 
or really leaves it open that if you could have a state religion, it'd probably be better. But if you have too many like people with different backgrounds, uh, it's totally fine not to either, just for pragmatic reasons. Even though out of necessity, there will be a unified religious background that has to arise, uh, whether people recognize it as religion or not. And this is why this is why civic religion arises. You know, the religion of like heroes, the religion of you know uh, our forefathers in the U.S., for example, uh, the founding well, like, fathers. I mean, we could just think of you know if someone <laughs> says. Oh. You know, I'm I'm culturally Christian or I'm culturally Jewish. What you know? What are they saying? They're saying that these uh, religious motivations, even if they don't accept dogmatically, you know, every premise that's like central to some people, you know, these these motivations determine our general actions with respect to the society, at, at least in some form. Yeah. So, uh, continuing. We do not need to enter here into consideration of the lame conclusion that the one who knows the human being must be absolute in order to grasp the absolute, uh, because the same thing applies to faith, to immediate knowledge, which is a grasping within itself, if not a grasping of the absolute spirit of God, or at least of the infinite. If this knowledge is so fearful of the concreteness of its object, then the latter must at least be something for it. It is really the non-concrete, which has few, if any, qualities at all, that is the abstract, the negative, the least, perchance, uh, the least perchance the infinite. But it is just by means of this miserable abstraction of the infinite that representational thought repels the grasping of the infinite for the simple reason that over against the infinite this worldly human being, human spirit, human reason is equally fixed as the abstraction of the finite. Representational thought would be more readily, would more readily allow that human spirit, thought, or reason could grasp the absolutely necessary for the latter is thus directly declared and stated to be the negative vis-a-vis -vis its other, the contingent which has on its part a necessity to external necessity, what therefore can be clearer than that the human being, who after all is, that is, is something positive and affirmative, cannot grasp its negative. And conversely, is it not still more clear that since the being and affirmation of human being is finitude and therefore negation, it cannot grasp infinitude, which as opposed to finitude, is equally a negation, but in the reverse, which way which it is being an affirmer. Sorry, but in the reverse way, since it is being an affirmation in contrast with the quality that attached to finitude. What then can be clearer than that finitude comes to the human being from both sides? One can grasp a few feet of space, but beyond this volume lies the infinitude of space. One is given a span of infinite time, which shrinks into an instant vis a vis the infinitude just as one's volume shrinks into a point. But apart from this external finitude vis-a-vis -vis those infinite externalities of space and time, the human being is intelligence, able to perceive, represent, and know, cognize. The object of human intelligence is the world, this aggregate of infinite singular things. Yet how small is the number of these things known by individual humans? It is not the human being who knows, but the individual, as compared with the infinite mass that actually exists. So, you know, this is just the general statement that the, the distinction of the infinite from the finite as a hard distinction itself makes it so that the finite is just another form of the finite. I mean, the infinite is just another form of the finite, and finitude is infinitized <coughs> by being uh, set in its own rigid distinction independent of the infinite. In order to be properly aware of the insignificance of human knowledge, we have only to remember something that cannot be denied and that we are accustomed to understand in terms of divine omniscience. It is pictured as follows by, follows by the organist in L. Uh, in a funeral sermon reported in Life Careers on Ascending Lines, Part 2, Supplement B, to recall to mind once again this deeply humorous work. Quote, 
Neighbor Bryce spoke to me yesterday about the greatness of the dear God, and I had the sudden idea that the dear God was able to name every sparrow, every goldfinch, every wren, every mite, and every gnat or fly, just as you call the people in the village Schmieds, Gregory, Breezes, Peter, Heifrids, Hans. Just think how the dear God can call to every one of the gnats which are so like each other that you would swear they were all brothers and sisters. Just think of it. End quote. As compared with practical finitude, the theoretical element presents itself as great and wide, yet how thoroughly we realize that human limitation is, uh, what human limitation is, when those aims, plans, desires, etc., that have no limits in the mind, are brought into contact with the reality for which they are intended. All the breaths of practical imagination, all the endeavor and aspiration, reveal their narrowness by the very fact that they are only endeavors, only aspirations. It is this finitude with which the attempt to grasp and comprehend the infinite is confronted. The critical understanding which holds to this principle supposed to be so convincing has in fact not gotten beyond the stage of culture of the organist in L, has not even attained to it. The organist used such a naive idea in order to picture the greatness of the dear God to a peasant community, but the critical understanding employs such a finitude against God's love and greatness that is against God's presence in the human spirit. This understanding keeps firmly in mind the gnats of finitude and the proposition we have already considered. The finite is a proposition, the falseness of which is directly evident, for the finite is something whose quality in nature is to pass away, is not to be. Thus the finite precisely cannot be thought and represented without the quality of non-being that resides in passing away. Who has the breath to say? The finite passes away. If the now is inserted between the finite and its passing away, and if in this way a kind of stability is given to being, the finite passes away, but now it exists, then this now is something that not only passes away, but has itself already passed away, since it is simply now. The fact that I have a consciousness of the now and have put it into words shows that it no longer exists, but is something other. It endures, to be sure, but not as this now, and now can only mean this now, something that exists only as a point in this instant without duration. It endures precisely as a negation of this now, as a negation of the finite, and thus as infinite as universal. The universal is already infinite, that respect for with the finite that keeps the understanding from finding the infinite in every universal ought to be called a foolish respect. The infinite is lofty and majestic, but to place its grandeur and majesty in that countless swarm of gnats, in the infinitude of knowledge in knowing those countless gnats, that is, individual gnats, is a proof of the incapacity, not of faith, not of spirit, nor of reason, but rather of the understanding to grasp the finite as a nullity, to grasp its being as something that has equally the value in sanctification of non-being. So the thing about the now is a pretty simple thing, that uh, the meaning of the now is the precise, immediate, finite moment, which by definition is passing away. And the now is, contextual, is a self-contextualizing, which immediately posits prior nows and posterior nows, a before and an after. So a now is only now because it is not that now which is to come or that now which has passed away. <laughs> but the now doesn't have a duration. Like uh, it, it is temporal duration itself, but it doesn't have any lasting duration because it's immediate. The moment it is, it's immediately gone. So Hegel's pointing out that the now cannot even the now can never be specified uh, as self-identical, precisely because you never, even to do that requires that, as we are saying it, as we're pointing it out. The now we're pointing out has already passed away. Uh, and it's not a matter of how quick you do it, it's just a matter of the fact that you do it, the fact that it first had the first the now has to come to be. In its being it is notice, which is already a shift in nows. It's in its its enunciation, the now shifts away even further. And by the time you say this is now, 
the now, the infinitesimal moment has vanished. <coughs> so the so the finite being is its non-being. Uh, the moment it is, it also is not. Uh, he says uh, uh, it endures precisely as negation of this now as a negation of finite and thus as infinite as universals universals are infinite uh, <coughs> the now is both a finite and a universal in that uh, you posit the immediate now you start pointing it out or rather you could contextualize it you know the now it's now as opposed to the now that comes afterwards as opposed to the now that came before so this now is a now which is negatively relating the past as the now that not is, the future is the now that not is, and the now is that now that is not, is neither the past nor the future, which is a negation of negation. So the, the present now contains the reference of the future now and the past now, and therefore becomes the concrete universal which in thinking any of its parts, either the past, the future, or the present, if you want to consider that a different one, <coughs> will produce the entirety of the now as a self-understanding, which is these distinctions. So it's a, it's a true universal, it's a concrete universal, although very, very abstract. The infinitude of spirit Spirit is immortal and eternal, and it is both of these in virtue of being infinite. It has no spatial finitude such as this, human body, five feet high, two feet wide and thick. Oh, well, we, we get what Hegel was into. <laughs> uh, good taste, must agree. Nor does it possess the now of time. Its knowledge does not consist of those countless nets. Its volition and freedom do not have to do with the infinite number of obstacles or with the aims and activities that such obstacles and hindrances encounter. The infinitude of spirit is its being within itself. In an abstract sense, its pure being within self. This is its thinking, and this abstract thinking is an actual present infinitude. Its concrete being within itself is the fact that this thinking is spirit. Pretty clear, at least to me. Uh, thus, from the absolute separation of the two sides, we have come back to their connection, and it makes no difference whether this connection is represented as existing in a subjective or objective sphere. The only question is whether it has been correctly comprehended. Insofar as it is represented as something only subjective, as a proof only for us, it is, of course, conceded that it is not objective and has not been correctly comprehended in and for itself. But what is incorrect is not to be located in the claim that there is no such connection at all, in other words, that no elevation of the spirit to God takes place. The real point, therefore, would be to consider the nature of this connection in its determinateness. This consideration is the deepest of our concerns, the most exalted, and thus also the most difficult. It cannot be carried out by means of finite categories. The ways of thinking that we are accustomed to use in common life, in dealing with contingent things, and also in the sciences, are not adequate to it. The latter have their foundation, their logic and connections that belong to the finite, such as cause and effect. Their laws, their classifications, their modes of arguing are mere relations belonging to what is conditioned, and they lose their meaning in these heights of spirit. To be sure, they must be employed, but in such a way that they are always taken back and corrected. the community of God and humanity with each other. The object of our concern, the community and communion of God and humanity with each other, is a community of spirit with spirit, and it involves the most important questions. 
It is a community, and in this very circumstance involves the difficulty at once maintaining the difference and of defining it in such a way as to preserve the communion. That humanity knows God implies, in accord with the essence of community, a communal knowledge. That is to say, humanity knows God only insofar as God knows God's self in humanity. This knowledge is God's self-consciousness, but it is at the same time a knowledge of God on the part of humanity, and this knowledge of God by humanity is the knowledge of humanity by God. The spirit of humanity, to know God, is simply God's spirit itself. It is here that the questions regarding the freedom of humanity, the unity of humanity's individual knowledge and consciousness with the knowledge by which humanity is in communion with God, in the knowledge of God, in humanity, come to be discussed. This fullness of relationship between the human spirit and God is not, however, our subject. We have to take up this relationship only in its most abstract aspect, namely in the form of the connection of the finite with the infinite. However strong the contrast is between the poverty of this connection and the wealth of its content, still the logical relation is at the same time the basis for the movement of that fullness of content. And uh, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, about uh, uh, before we started reading about uh, religion and its particular determinations and meanings. Uh, where religion is mere relinking in abstraction uh, is not does not capture the concept of what religion really must entail, uh, which both has to be the concept of the absolute uh, as God, but also it necessarily must have communal consequences. So. <coughs> So, um, I think uh, Dr. Master pointed out the whole thing about uh, how New Age mysticism uh, is perhaps capturing uh, the the original quote unquote notion of religion because uh, they're relinking through God through a you know direct personal mystical experience. And for this, for for Hegel, this is not religion. Uh, religion proper is institutions of religion which are communal institutions in which communities of people are brought together explicitly and bound by these doctrines of essential faith and belief uh, which are not mere beliefs but are faiths they are the very things they're the very concepts or categories that structure the intelligibility of the world and our activities in it uh, and therefore, religion binds everything together. And the deepest sense of a community has to be a religious community, uh, which in Hegelian terms means that religious community is the truth of community as such. Uh, you cannot have a true community that isn't also a religious community. And okay, that was the end of lecture 14. Do we have a religious community, A.W.? I would say that we are building towards one. I will consider it to be established objectively when we have Bunker House. Got it. Lecture 15. The speculative view of the transition from finite to infinite. The connection between these categories of thought, finite and infinite, which constitutes the entire content of the proof under discussion, has already been the object of our investigation in the preceding lectures. That this connection does not correspond to what is supposed to be accomplished in the proof is a matter essentially still to be discussed later. The, peculiar, the peculiarly speculative aspect of the con of the connection remains, however, to be considered, and we have here to indicate, without entering upon this logical examination in detail, which characteristic of this connection concerns the speculative aspect. 
The element to which attention has mainly to be directed in this connection is that it is a transition, that is to say, the point of departure has here the quality of something negative, it exists as a contingent being, a mere appearance, which finds its truth in the absolutely necessary, in the truly affirmative character of the latter. <coughs> By the way, just uh, commenting for the viewers, I would hope that it has become apparent, but I can understand if it didn't, that uh, despite the fact that so far this has only discussed explicitly the cosmological proof, all of this has already entailed all three forms of the proof. Cosm the cosmological proof, the theological proof, and the ontological proof. Uh, and uh, everything that's been discussed really about the issues, uh, particularly in absolute necessity in the second lecture on the cosmological proof, <coughs> has already given us all the resources to see what's coming and what is also the problem of the theological proof and the ontological proof and what is the solution. Like this whole talk about, the, about absolute necessity and the way in which it had to be a self-constituting necessity uh, is if you can recognize the formality going on to some extent, uh, it's a formal analogy to the issue of the infinite here and that's why we shifted over to the finite and infinite problem away from the absolute necessity problem, the one of the contingency and necessity. Uh, these are all different levels of the issue <coughs> and shedding light on the same problem from a different perspective uh, in the moments of the system of speculative philosophy. <coughs> Excuse me. In regard, first of all, to the first of these qualities, the negative element, what belongs to the speculative comprehension is simply that this element is not to be taken as a mere nothing. It is not present in this abstract way, but is merely an element in the contingency of the world. There ought, therefore, to be no difficulty in taking the negative as an abstract nothing. In what representation has before it, as con contingency, limitation, finitude, appearance, it has a determinate being and existence, but it essentially involves negation. Representational thinking is more concrete and true than the abstractive understanding, which, when it hears of a negative, too readily makes nothingness out of it, mere nothingness to nothing as such, and gives up all thought of its being connected with existence, insofar as the latter is defined as contingent, phenomenal, etc. Discursive analysis points to the two elements in such a content, an affirmative element to determine it being existence as a being, an element that involves the quality of finality, mortality, limit, etc. In the form of negation, thought, if it is to grasp the contingent, must not allow these elements to fall apart into a nothing on its own terms and a being on its own terms, for they are not found in this way in the contingent, rather it comprises both within itself. Each of the elements does not, therefore, exist on its own terms in connection with the other. The contingent itself, as it is, is to be taken as this connection of the two. This, then, is a speculative determination. It remains true to the content of representational thought, whereas this content escapes abstract thought, which holds fast to the two elements, each on its own terms, and which has dissolved the contingent, the object of the understanding. <coughs> okay, let me read that, because uh, while reading it, it kind of went over my head. <coughs> So in regard, first of all, to the first of these qualities, the negative element, what belongs to the speculative comprehension is simply, um, okay, I'm negative element of what? Uh, the connection between these categories of thought, finite and infinite, which constitutes the entire content of the proof under discussion. This connection does not correspond to what is supposed to be accomplished in the proof, is a matter essentially still to be discussed later. The peculiarly speculative aspect of the connection remains, however, to be considered. Uh, da, da, da. The element to which attention is mainly to be directed in this connection is that it is a transition, that is to say, the point of departure has to be, has here the quality of something negative, it exists as a contingent being, a mere appearance. Okay, so he's, we're starting with the finite, which is also the contingent, which necessarily must be a negative beginning. <coughs> So, in regards, first of all, to the first of these qualities, negative element, which is the finite contingent, 
What belongs to the speculative comprehension is simply that this element is not to be taken as a mere nothing. <coughs> it is not present in this abstract way, but is merely an element in the contingency of the world. There ought therefore to be no difficulty in taking the negative as an abstract nothing. In what representation has before it as contingency, limitation, finitude, appearance, it has a determinate being and existence, but it essentially evol involves negation. Representational thinking is more concrete and true than the abstractive understanding which, when it hears of a negative, too readily makes nothing out of it, mere nothing as to nothing as such, and it gives up all thought of its being connected with existence. Okay, so just the uh, warning against, uh, well, if we take that, if we say then uh, that the contingent is that which is only a mere seeming or a passing away or a mere relative, uh, you don't pull Leibniz in once you go like, ah, so it's all real, so this is relative, so we don't need to talk about it because all the relative things are not real anyways, they're derivative of something else. What we want to talk about is only what is, uh, we don't talk about nothings, you know, the nothings are irrelevant, so, you know, there, there are no relations, the only things that there are are substances which are blah, 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 uh, whereas Hegel says, no, here, like, we, we must hold the nothing to be part of this. Uh, it's not just something like, once you recognize, oh, it's a, a relative contingent, uh, ephemeral, whatever, we can throw it away immediately. <coughs> that leads to problems. It leads to the dualities that appear in Leibniz, which then lead to the dualities that appear in uh, Kant. The contingent as thus defined is a contradiction within itself. What resolves or dissolves itself likewise becomes exactly what it becomes in the hands of the understanding. <coughs> But the dissolution resolution is of two sorts. That which is affected by the understanding results simply in the disappearance of the object, the concrete connection, while on the other kind of resolution the object is preserved. Still this preservation does not help it much, or not at all, for in being thus preserved it is defined as a contradiction, and a contradiction dissolves itself. What contradicts itself is nothing. However correct this may be, it is at the same time incorrect. Contradiction and nothing are at all events distinct from one another. Contradiction is concrete. It, is, it at least has a content. It contains things that contradict themselves. It declares and expresses what it is a contradiction of. Nothing, on the contrary, does not express anything at all. It is devoid of content. It is the completely empty. This concrete quality of the one and the wholly abstract quality of the other constitute a very important difference. Further, nothing is, in no sense, a contradiction. Nothing does not contradict itself. It is identical with itself. Thus it completely fulfills the logical proposition, something ought not to contradict itself. Or if this proposition is reformulated to say, nothing ought to contradict itself. This is an ought that has no result, for nothing does not do what it ought. It does not contradict itself. <laughs> I love bullshit wordplay like this. <laughs> well, it's not bullshit, but uh, it strikes you as bullshit when you first encounter it. <coughs> Uh, it has a point. If, however, it is formulated as a thesis, nothing that exists contradicts itself, then it is plainly correct. For the subject of this proposition is a nothing that at the same time is, but nothing itself as such is merely simple. The one quality that is identical with itself does not contradict itself. Ah, oh, that is perfect right there. Nothing that exists contradicts itself. <laughs> uh, that's a great speculative proposition. <clears throat> I don't know if you all find it as amusing as I do. It's pretty good. Yeah. <clears throat> I can picture Hegel like putting his nose in the air while he says that, like lifting, tilting his head back a little. <laughs> He's very snooty in a good way. Continuing. Thus the resolution dissolution of the contradiction into nothing as given by the understanding moves about an emptiness or more precisely in contradiction itself, which in virtue of such a resolution declares itself in fact still to endure as unresolved. The reason why the contradiction is still unresolved is just that the content, the contingent, is first posited only in its negation within itself and not yet in the affirmation that must be contained in this resolution since it is not abstract nothing. Even the contingent is surely to begin with, as it represents 
as it presents itself to representation and affirmative. <coughs> it is a determinate being and existence. It is the world, affirmation, reality, or whatever it is to be called, and this is more than sufficient. But as such, it is not yet posited in its resolution, in the explication of its content and substance, and it is just this content that is meant to lead to its truth to the absolutely necessary. It is the contingent itself in which, as has been said, the finitude, the limitation of the world has been prepared to such an extent that it immediately signifies its own resolution, namely in terms of the negative side that has been indicated. The resolution of this contingent, which is posited as already resolved in the contradiction, is seen to be the affirmative that is contained within it. This resolution has already been indicated. It has been obtained and adopted from the representation formed by the human mind of the transition of spirit from the contingent to the absolute necessary, which accordingly would itself be this very affirmative, the resolution of that first and merely negative resolution. Thus, to indicate the speculative aspect in this final and most inner point would simply mean to put it in a completely connected form, the thoughts that are con to put, a uh, to put in a completely connected form the thoughts that are already contained in what we are dealing with, namely that first resolution. The understanding that comprehended it merely as a contradiction that resolves itself into nothing takes up only of the two qualities contained in it and leaves the other side. Only one of the two qualities contained in it and leaves the other side. <coughs> Okay, yeah. Seemed pretty straightforward to me. As a matter of fact, the concrete result in its explicit shape, that is, its speculative form, has already been long established, namely in the definition that has been given of absolute necessity. In that regard, however, an external reflection and mode of argument was used for the elements that belong to this necessity or from which it results. What needs to be done here is merely to call attention to these elements that are found in what we have seen to be the contradiction that constitutes the resolution of the contingent. In absolute necessity we have seen first the element of mediation, and indeed initially mediation through an other. The analysis of the contingent directly shows that its moments are being in general or worldly existence, in the negation of the latter whereby it is degraded to the significance of a semblance, an intrinsic nullity. Each of the moments is not isolated and taken on its own, but rather is attached to the one quality, that of the contingent that has its meaning only and utterly in relation to the other. This one quality which holds them together is what mediates them. In it, to be sure, the one is mediated by the other, but apart from it, each can be for itself, and indeed ought to be for itself, being for itself and negation for itself. If, however, we take being in the concrete shape in which we have it here, namely as worldly existence, then we virtually admit that it is not for itself, not absolute, not eternal, but is rather intrinsically a nullity, a nullity that has a being, to be sure, but not a being for self, and just this sort of being is defined as contingent. <clears throat> if now in the state of contingency <clears throat> each of these qualities exists only in relation to the other, this mediation between them itself appears to be contingent, to be merely isolated, to be found only in this place. What is unsatisfying is that the qualities can be taken for themselves as they themselves are as such, as related only to themselves and therefore immediately and thus as not mediated in themselves. Mediation is consequently something that happens to them in a merely external way, and is itself contingent. That is, the peculiar inner necessity of contingency is not demonstrated. Okay. Uh, let me reread that. As a matter of fact, the concrete result in its explicit shape, that is, its speculative form, has already been long established, namely in the definition that has been given of absolute necessity. In that regard, however, an external reflection and mode of argument was used for the elements that belong to this necessity or from which it results. What needs to be done here is merely to call to attention, call attention to these elements that are found in what we have seen to be the contradiction that constitutes the resolution of the contingent. In absolute necessity, we have seen first the element of mediation, and indeed initially mediation through another. The analysis of the contingent directly shows that its moments are being in general or worldly existence, and the negation of the latter whereby it is degraded to the significance of a semblance and intrinsic nullity. <coughs> uh, so, okay, the, for those of you who haven't listened, uh, 
then you better go listen to the last uh, uh, video on, I think, uh, 12 and 13, uh, in which uh, this was particularly gone over. <coughs> There's a, a uh, section on an argument about uh, what point of view one is taking uh, on the proposition that there is a, a there is a contingent world, therefore there is an absolute necessary being. Or the or rather, yeah, you could place it that way. That the fact that the the is there, the is of the contingent world, and the is of the absolute necessary being. <coughs> there is a way in which we can focus the argument to really be about how uh, the contingent and the absolute necessary are sort of appearances of of this being, which to which they are predicates of. Uh, and then there's a another form of argumentation which is not about this external identity that links them, uh, or rather that to which they are external qualities to this substance or identity. Uh, and the link between the contingent as contingent and the absolute necessary as absolute necessary. So the analysis of the contingent directly shows that its moments are being in general or worldly existence and the negation of the latter, whereby it is degraded to the significance of a semblance and intrinsic nullity. <coughs> so in the, the being connection, uh, worldly existence or the contingent is merely a, a, a semblance, a non-being, as opposed to the true being, which is just the absolutely necessary, uh, which then is revealed to be the only being. Each of the moments is not isolated and taken on its own, but rather is attached to the one quality, that of the contingent, and has its meaning only and utterly in relation to the other. Uh, so, uh, each of the moments is not isolated and taken on its own, but rather is attached to the one quality, that of the contingent, and has its meaning only and utterly in relation to the other. <coughs> so the very way that it's set up, the very way the, the proposition of the arguments are set up and connected, and the way the the construction of the propositions individually themselves is a contingent proposition uh, because the contingent as such may or may not be and therefore the is is contingently attached to the contingent uh, and the contingent because it may or may not be and is dependent upon the absolutely necessary uh, puts itself in a relationship a contingent relationship to the necessary as contingent and the necessary obviously has a contingent relationship to the contingent as con because it is necessary alone it doesn't have to have a relationship to the contingent <coughs> so then the whole syllogism is completely contingent so um, what he says here uh, Uh, if now the state of co in the state of contingency each of the qualities exists only in relation to the other, this mediation between them itself appears to be contingent, to be merely isolated, to be found only in this place. Uh, so the very judgment of the syllogism that, you know, oh, well, if there is a contingent world, uh, then there is an absolutely necessary being. There is a contingent world, therefore there is an absolutely necessary being. Uh, the connection of the contingent and the, the necessary, in this case, is contingent. The relationship of the being to the contingent and being to necessary is contingent, uh, and the whole thing becomes one giant contingent if. Uh, <laughs> and so that's why the mediation <coughs> is uh, entirely contingent itself. It's an external relationship. Continuing. This reflection thus leads to the necessity of the starting point in itself, which we have taken as something given, as precisely a starting point. It leads not to the transition from the contingent to the necessary, but to the transition that is implicitly contained in the contingent itself, the transition from one of each of the elements that constitute the contingent to its other. This would bring us back to the analysis of the first abstract logical elements, and it suffices here to regard contingency as the transition in itself by which it sublates itself as it is viewed representational. <coughs> in the
In the resolution of contingency just described, there is at the same time indicated the second element, that of absolute necessity, namely the element of mediation with self. The elements of contingency are initially in opposition to each other, and each is posited as mediated by its other. In the unity of the two, however, each is something negated, and thus their difference is annulled. Although we still speak of one of the two, it is no longer related to something different from it, but to itself, thus mediation with self is posited. <coughs> the speculative view accordingly signifies that the contingent is known in itself in its resolution, which initially appears as an external analysis of this quality of contingency. It is not merely this, however, but the resolution of the latter in itself. The contingent by its very nature is that which resolves and dissolves itself. It, it's, it is transition in itself. But in the second place, this resolution is not the abstraction of nothingness, rather it is affirmation within the resolution, the affirmation that we call absolute necessity. It is in this way that the transition is conceived. The result is shown to be imminent in the contingent. That is, it is the very nature of the contingent to revert back to its truth. The elevation of our spirit to God, insofar as we have provisionally no further definition of God than that of absolute necessary being, or because for the moment we are satisfied with it, is the course of development followed by this movement of the thing religion is about. It is this thing in and for itself, which is the driving power within us, that which drives this movement within us. Okay, so I'm not sure if he's going to explain the thing of absolute necessity, but uh, we've already gone over this in the, like, two recordings ago. <coughs> A basic gist would be this, that the contingent being contingent <coughs> only is by the fact that it is contingent upon conditions. The conditions being given, the, continu the contingent can be said to be, but once it comes like it is contingent, this contingency is contingently necessary, or rather just the contingency becomes necessary because if the condition is there, then the Contingency, which is the effect, the condition would be the cause, and the contingency is the effect. If the cause is there, the effect is there. Therefore, you give the conditions, the contingent effect is necessarily given. <coughs> because the contingent as contingent as that which may or may not be, may or may not be only if it is taken in abstraction, uh, unrelated to anything else. Uh, it's just pure logical possibility. Uh, but if it is a determinate thing, even a logical determinate thing, it's not abstractly existent within itself. To exist, even as a logical entity, in this case, uh, just as a concept, already gives it conditional relations upon the conditions of its own intelligibility. So that the contingent is only intelligible precisely because there is a necessary, there is a condition which posits it as an after effect, or an effect really, just mere effect. Uh, of its conditionality, and therefore the contingent is contingent upon that which is its condition, which is in that relationship the necessary. And then you take that, and the necessary in itself is supposed to be that which is not posited by another, and therefore is fully self contained, uh, unrelated. Uh, it's an uncaused cause, but it's only a cause in relationship to the contingent, and therefore which makes it continually a cause. Uh, and therefore that which is necessary falls away again into contingency when you take it out of its relationship to the contingent which it posits as necessary to its cause. <coughs> <coughs> so therefore you get to flip from the contingent to the necessary and the necessary back to the contingent. And so you have, so another way to a second order way to phrase it is the contingent is contingently necessary and the, nece the necessary is necessarily contingent. <laughs> and that's what absolute necessity is. It is the unity of this movement in which that which is contingent is contingent only because it really is necessary within some chain of other contingent conditionals. And the conditionals are themselves necessary only insofar as they are contingent from their own standpoint. Uh, outside the context of their given conditions. <coughs> Another way to phrase it is that the contingent is necessarily contingent. 
<coughs> and the, the necessary is also contingently necessary. Uh, that's a quick rundown now. I'm not sure if that made as much sense as I hoped it does. Uh, but if you want more uh, elaboration, just go and listen to the prior recordings on that. <coughs> Continuing. It has already been remarked that for consciousness to which the categories of thought do not present themselves in this pure speculative form, and consequently not in their self-resolution and self-movement, but which rather has them in representational form, the transition is facilitated by the fact that that the fact that what we start from, the contingent, already means something that resolves itself and passes over. In this way, the connection between what it starts from and what it reaches is made clear to it. This starting point is therefore the one that is the most advantageous and the most expedient for consciousness. It is the instinct of thought that intrinsically makes its transition, which is the thing religion is about. But at the same time, this instinct brings it to consciousness in the form of a category such that it readily appears to its merely representational way of thinking as abstractly identical. When in fact the world is defined as a contingent, its non-being is alluded to as well as its other, its truth. So the transition is made intelligible by the fact that it is not only implicitly contained in the starting point, but also that the latter directly signifies the transition. This quality is also posited and thus in it. <clears throat> In this way, its determined existence is given for consciousness, which thinks representationally just insofar as it has to do with immediate existence, which is here a category of thought. Equally intelligible is the result, the, the absolutely necessary. It contains mediation, it is just this understanding of the connection in general that is the most intelligible, a connection that in a finite way is taken as the connection of the one with another, but that also carries its correction with it insofar as such connection issues an insufficient end. Such a connection, owing to the fact that its law constantly demands that it should repeat itself in its material, always leads of itself to an other that is, to a negative, while the affirmative that reappears in its progression is merely something that issues from itself, and thus the one as well as the other find no rest in satisfaction. The absolutely necessary, since on the one hand it produces that connection itself, is something that on, that on the other hand can break off the connection, bring back into itself this going out of itself, and secure the final result. The absolutely necessary is, because it is, thus that other and the going out to the other are set aside, and by this unconscious in consequence, satisfaction is secured. Oh, well, that was a really short lecture. <laughs> Hardly a lecture at all. <coughs> okay, then. What else was he doing in that class? If that's all he had to say. Well, you know, uh, maybe he came up with a micro lesson before Lacan came up with the micro sessions. Sixteenth <laughs> lecture, okay, one ninety nine to sixteen. Okay, well, the sixteenth lecture seems like it might be. It's about sixteen pages. What is the title? I think that's a good place to leave it for today. So, uh, all right, for those who are listening, hopefully you found hopefully you found this uh, interesting. Uh, we're almost done with the book. There's only one, two, three, four, four more lectures, and I think the cosmological proof is a mainly long one again, and the teleological proof and ontological proof are much shorter. So. We might finish it in two more uh, sessions. But all right, uh, see you next time.